The following is a special video presentation of the Hennepin County Library. Hello and welcome to a discussion with W.P. Kinsella. I'm Stu Thornley and today our guest is the author of numerous stories and writings on topics ranging from baseball to contemporary Indian life. W.P. Kinsella's latest work is the Dixon Corn Belt League and other baseball stories. And in this book, Bill, the title story, the Dixon Corn Belt League, takes us back to a familiar turf, a place that has obviously had a great influence on your life, Iowa. Yes, I set the story in Grand Mound, Iowa, which is a real town, of course, and uh, it's a story about a young man whose college baseball career sort of fizzles out and his agent places him with an independent league in rural Iowa and he absolutely loves the town of Grand Mound. The people are uh, really good to him. They're fanatical baseball fans who come out to watch every practice and every inter-squad game but slowly he comes to realize that things aren't quite as they seem. The beginning of the baseball season keeps getting put off and put off and uh, uh, he discovers that uh, life is a little stranger than he anticipated in Grand Mound. But idyllic's still the same. Right, right. And that's the way you, you normally treat Iowa, which has had an influence both as your career as a writer, and it was when your career really got going when you went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, but you've also made the statement about Iowa that you never had any feelings for a place until you went to Iowa. Well, I think that's true. I went to Iowa City in 1976 as a student, and I really fell in love with Iowa City and with the surrounding area, and I think my love for the state comes through in many of my uh, writings about baseball. Right, and we're familiar with it, of course, with Shoeless Joe and the, and the full novel, The Iowa Baseball uh, Confederacy. You, at this point, you had always been a writer, even as you grew up in, in rural Alberta or in an isolated area, but uh, uh, you describe yourself as a writer and doing it while you had a series of hateful jobs that uh, continued up until about the time that you came to Iowa. Well, that's true. I. Uh had to do all sorts of strange things to keep food on the table. I'm one of these people who woke up at age five knowing how to read and write, and I've been writing ever since, and had to beat my head against the walls of North American literature for about 25 years before I became an overnight success with Shoeless Joe. And it was actually a short story, Shoeless Joe Comes to Iowa, that then became the basis for the full-length novel. And that's really what your writing has usually been, is, is more the collection of stories, whether it be on the Cree Indians or on baseball, as we see here in the Dixon Corn Belt League. Well, I've done, I don't know how many collections of stories and uh, four novels. Uh, I think I prefer writing short fiction, um, mainly for the investment of time. If I spend a week writing a short story and it fails, then all I've lost is a week. But if I'm going to start a novel, then I need to be pretty sure that it's going to work before I start it, because I'm going to invest uh, 9 to 18 months in a, in a novel, and uh, that can seriously cut into your income if it doesn't uh, work. But what may be your best-known novel, Shoeless Joe, which has been made into the movie Field of Dreams, started off as just that, a short story, which is now the first chapter in the full novel. That's true. I wrote that story with no idea of taking it anywhere else, but uh, it was published in an anthology. The anthology was reviewed by Publishers Weekly, which is the Bible of the book trade, and a young editor at Houghton Mifflin in Boston uh, read a two-line review of my story in the review of the anthology in Publishers Weekly, and on the strength of that wrote to me and said, gee, we're all baseball fans here at Houghton Mifflin. This sounds like such a wonderful idea, this young man uh, building a baseball diamond in his cornfield. Now, if this is a novel, we'd like to see it, and if it isn't, it should be. And at that point, uh, I said, well, I've got a major publisher interested in a novel, so I'm going to try and come up with a novel. So I gathered all the things together that I had planned 
to do sometime in the future, and I knew that I wanted to write a story about J.D. Salinger because he makes himself conspicuous by hiding. I knew that I wanted to write something about Moonlight Graham because of the uh, very small entry in the baseball encyclopedia. This man had played one instant of Major League Baseball. I knew I wanted to write something about an old man that I met on the streets of Iowa City who had uh, claimed to be the oldest living Chicago Cub and uh, turned out to be the first sports imposter that I had <laughs> met. So I, I tried to find some common ground to, uh, to tie all these things together. And I, I went back and reread all of J.D. Salinger's uncollected and collected work and discovered that he had used two characters named Kinsella in his stories. And Kinsella is not a, a common name, so I, uh, I thought, all right, this will be the key. I will name my character in the first chapter. I will name him Ray Kinsella after Salinger's character in an uncollected story. Then Ray can go off to New Hampshire, turn up on Salinger's doorstep, and say, hey, I'm one of your uh, fictional characters. <laughs> Come back to life. And interestingly enough, I got a letter a couple of years ago from a Kinsella, I think in Ohio, um, who had been Salinger's college roommate. So that was how he came to uh, know the name and use it a couple of times in his story. So you at least tracked down the source of that, but you've never actually met J.D. Salinger himself, have you? No, no, I, I didn't want to. I, uh, I drove up to uh, the Vermont, New Hampshire area where he lives, uh, looked at the post office where he gets his mail and drove along some <laughs> of the country roads. I didn't even look specifically for where he lived. I mean. Uh, First of all, I don't want to bother the guy, and secondly, what am I going to say to him anyway? Um, hi, I'm writing a, a book, and I'm going to use you as a character. Uh, that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, my, I had to spend a couple of days with my publisher's libel lawyers, and they made me make some, some changes to the script, but not too much. And uh, they said, uh, now look, uh, the only thing that he can sue us for is about the sixth definition of libel, which is called false light. And in order to do that, he'll have to go to court himself, which he won't want to do, and he'll have to say, look, I've been portrayed in this novel as a kindly, loving, humorous individual. Uh, in reality, I'm a surly son of a gun who sits in the bunker on the side of a hill and shoots at tourists when they drive by my house. Therefore, I've been portrayed in a false light. So they didn't think there was much chance of him doing that. and. Uh, he didn't, but the movie people didn't want to take a chance on a uh, nuisance lawsuit uh, just as they were spending $10 million to publicize the movie. So they changed the character. The part was written specifically for James Earl Jones, and they were lucky enough to get him for the movie. So all of the, 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 the legal investigation dealt with Shoeless Joe as it was being turned into the movie field of, of dreams, that it wasn't an issue when you were just writing the book and using J.D. Salinger as a character in the book. Right. Okay. Did, did you ever grapple with that your, yourself, that even all legalities aside, are you taking advantage of this person? He doesn't really want to be portrayed as a kind person, or, or we know that he won't come out and defend himself in court. Did, did you ever uh, think about some of the issues involved with that? Well, I, I the, the business of Ray sort of kidnapping him, I thought a lot about that. I, I thought, how would I feel if if I was being reclusive and, and this happened to me, am I invading this man's privacy? But my feeling is that uh, he has always made himself conspicuous by hiding. I mean, here's a man who hasn't published anything since 1963, and he still manages to keep his name in the news by raising heck every time someone mentions his name in print. And uh, he had also put himself through college working as an actor on a cruise ship, so he knew how to hold an audience. And he knows how to hold an audience, and he's done a spectacular job of it. So I, I, I considered those things, and I felt that really uh, all I'm doing is giving him a little more publicity. In the book, Ray Kinsella and J.D. Salinger get together. They go to the Iron Range of northern Minnesota, travel to Chisholm to learn more about Moonlight Graham and meet with the editor of the newspaper up there, Veda Panikvar. In reality, I believe it was you and your wife who made that trek, investigating the Iron Range area and, and meeting with Veda Panikvar as, as, your, uh, as, as your wife went around and talked to people about town and learned the stories. Uh, I met with Veda Panikvar a few years ago, and she claims that you and J.D. Salinger were in together. And it, it occurs to me that maybe she 
uh, after she read the book, had a little trouble separating the fiction, what she read from what actually happened. But as I read your stuff, I wonder, has that ever become any kind of a problem with you? All the fiction that you write, do you ever have to step back and think, wait a minute, did I just write that or did something like that really happen? Do you ever have trouble separating that? Uh, yes, I do. Sometimes I, uh, people will ask me about things in my book and I can't remember whether they actually happened or whether I made them up. And uh, I think that was the case that Vida uh, remembered differently after reading the book uh, because it definitely was uh, my wife and I who visited there. And we went back several years later and talked to her about it. Uh, and she didn't remember my wife at all. She, uh, <laughs> she still remembered the uh, thought I was with someone else. So she's still convinced that J.D. Salinger was actually with well, you? Well, I think she believes me that he wasn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. This, uh, the, the, the title character, Ray Kinsella, is influenced a lot by his father, but it appears that you, with this story too, were influenced by some of the stories that you heard from your dad about the, the Black Sox and about Shula's Joe, and that's, is that where some of the stories started to develop as you combine this with everything else, your affinity for Iowa and the desire to do something with the Moonlight Graham character? Well, there's very little autobiographical uh, material in my work. Uh, my dad did, did tell some stories about Joe Jackson. He had played some minor league baseball, uh, so that uh, that part was true. I got to, that, that was sort of how the thing came about. I got to thinking uh, about some stories my dad had told me about Joe Jackson and what became of him after the Black Sox scandal, and they were good stories, but not necessarily true stories. And uh, I just uh, thought, what would happen if, which is what authors spend their whole life. Uh, saying to themselves, what would happen if uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson came back to life in this time and place, which was Iowa City, Iowa, 1978. But uh, other than that, there's not a lot of uh, autobiography in my work. My novel, Box Socials, which I suppose has been the most successful book I've ever written, uh, it uses the setting and the situation where I grew up. but. Uh, as I tell students on the rare occasions when I teach writing, trust me, your lives are not interesting, don't write them down. Uh, this was the case with me because uh, my life and the life of my family uh, was not interesting at all. So though I've used the setting and the situation in box socials, I had to create all the characters and give them interesting things to do and, uh, and make them much more eccentric than they uh, ever were in real life. And most of them are not even modeled on, uh, on anyone real, uh, pretty much including my parents. Well, let's get back to where you grew up in, in uh, Alberta, outside, a ways outside of Edmonton in a very isolated area. And you, you did not really have baseball, a subject that you've written about as a part of your life growing up. Uh, for that matter, the other area that you've written extensively about Cree Indians is not something that you really had any uh, first-hand areas or first-hand knowledge in, but you gravi gravitated into both of these subjects. Well, I, I don't think you need to know very much about a subject to uh, write about it. Uh, you, you're, it's uh, like the, uh, the business of you. You only have to look like a leader in order to lead people. You don't uh, actually have to, uh, you just have to look the part. I think that's an old Chinese proverb or something. If you, if you dress someone up like a general, then they become a general. Um, I have a, a good knowledge of baseball. My uh, Dad talked a good game, and on the rare occasions when he'd get out to civilization when I was a child, he'd come back with a copy of the St. Louis Sporting News, and consequently I knew how to read a box score, and I knew who the baseball heroes of the 40s were uh, before I'd ever seen a baseball game. But uh, mo most of my work, uh, I tell people that when I need facts, I invent them. <laughs> and uh, that cools the ardor of many magazines and newspapers who want me to write for them, <laughs> because uh, I, I'm not a nonfiction. Uh, writer, and I, I don't want facts to interfere with a good story. Well, I, I still find that, that curious that you say you don't need to know too much to write about it because people who do know about Cree Indians or contemporary I Indian life have hailed you for your accuracy in portraying this. So uh, it, it's not just you're fooling the people who don't know any better. You're, you are apparently hitting the nail on, on the head. Well, whatever gift I have, it's to put myself in someone else's shoes. I mean, I, it's the same. Uh, I really don't know any baseball players. I've only met a half a dozen players for a few minutes uh, at a time over the years. But I can put myself in the position of a major league or a minor league baseball player. And uh, uh, 
You see, I, do, I don't. I claim that I don't write baseball stories. I write love stories that are peripherally about baseball. The, my my characters are grounded in the sport and uh, are, uh, have either played or are playing the game. But it's really the things that happen in their personal lives that are what I write about. And it's the same with the uh, native stories. I write about people who just happen to be native Indians because there is a great curiosity out there about native people and uh, I try to take advantage of that and uh, I'm able to put myself in the position of an 18 year old Indian boy and write. I've written I think 107 stories from Silas's point of view. There are seven collections of these stories now, but again, uh, the, his actual Indianness doesn't have a great deal to do with most of the stories. It's just the situations that he uh, gets into, and I'm able to imagine those situations without uh, doing any particular research. Okay, well, even if it's not facts that you have to deal with, uh, just being able to accurately paint a, a picture of some things. You said that your only special knowledge of baseball is from the baseball encyclopedia. This is where you came across the name Moonlight Graham, which is both curious, both his name, but also his, his limited entry in there. And, y and you said that as a fiction writer, you work from imagination, but I still have to, have to think that in some way, research or background knowledge uh, plays a part in it. As I read my favorite story in the Dixon Corn Belt League, Searching for January, about Roberto Clemente coming ashore 15 years later after, after his plane disappeared. And the narrator in this story was able to describe Clemente's great grace in the outfield. Obviously, you have to have some understanding of that, too, to be able to describe it. Well, I know baseball, and I, I saw Roberto Clemente play a few times, and uh, it was just a matter of trying to find a vivid description of the way that, uh, that he played. And... Uh, I don't think I actually did any research on that story, uh, uh, except looking up his date of death in the baseball encyclopedia. The, the, that story is interesting in that uh, I wrote it and I sent it out to magazines about ten times and it was rejected every time. And then I put the little epigraph on the beginning uh, saying that on uh, December 31st, 1972, Roberto Clemente took off with a uh, a uh, plane load of, load of uh, supplies for the Nicaraguan earthquake victims and that his plane crashed and so on. Uh, people have short memories, even editors. Uh, they apparently didn't, uh, really didn't know what that story was about uh, because it's a very good story and it came back eight or ten times. I put the epigraph on it and it was sold immediately. There's a lesson in that, isn't there? <laughs> uh, well, po politician, the politician's proverb is that sheep have short memories, but I guess we have to add to that editors also. Well, sometimes just setting it up with something like that and, and, and bringing back even the chilling memories to some people, and I can remember uh, my feelings when I saw the headline, Roberto Clemente dead in, in, in plane crash, and, and maybe that has a little impact too, in addition to both uh, setting the stage for the story. Mm -hmm. You've been, uh, your writing has, has been... Uh, complimented for many things, eye for detail, insight into human nature. Uh, according to something that you said once, though, all of that would appear to be secondary to first making sure that you entertain your readers, because you said a fiction writer's duty is to entertain. If you can sneak in something profound or symbolic, so much the better. But it seems like nobody ever wants to really focus on the fact that you're entertaining. They always think there's got to be something deeper than that. That's a major problem, I find, uh, that uh, th there's the two different levels of fiction writing. There's the, uh, the academic and uh, then the uh, general literature that's aimed to entertain. And I, I fall into both categories because my work gets studied by academics and when I write it, I write it to entertain a large audience. I mean, I don't care if it gets looked at by academics or not because there's no money in it. And I'm, uh, I'm in business to make a living as a writer, and uh, I, I always have been. I, I, and I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. I get some criticism sometimes for not having the Garrett mentality that I'm supposed to have, the uh, art for art's sake, you know, write convoluted uh, 
uh, literature that will get lots of academic attention and not earn you any money. Well, uh, if I had the ability, I would rather write a Harlequin romance and get well paid for it than uh, write an academic novel that sells 500 copies and gets uh, praised in the non-paying literary journals. Uh, I do feel that a writer's first obligation is to entertain their audience. The storytelling goes back to the days of the caveman when Ugg stood up in front of the campfire and pounded his chest and said, listen to me, I want to tell you about uh, hunting a brontosaurus this afternoon. And if he wasn't a very good storyteller, everyone would slink off to their caves. Uh, however, if he was a good storyteller, they'd all stay there enthralled. And I, and I think... Uh, uh, a fiction writer's first duty is to enthrall their audience and make them interested and make them laugh and leave them with a little tear in their eye. I, as I said, if you can sneak in something profound or symbolic, well, that's fine. I always try to put some things in there. I mean, my, my experience is that academics derive sexual stimulation from finding uh, good uh, similes and metaphors and symbols in work, so I always try to stick some things in there, sometimes <laughs> falsely, uh, just to give uh, academics a cheap thrill. Uh, but uh, the first layer I is always story, is always entertainment. Then uh, if you can sneak something else in, well, that's fine. Well, do you ever feel that in some of the reviews, even as good as they are, they're heaping encomiums on you, but they're shortchanging you by not just saying, and it's a great read, it's very interesting, I couldn't put it down. Well, that's the, I would much rather uh, have a reviewer say, yes, this is, uh, I laughed at this. I, I, uh, I had a, was left with a tear in my eye. I mean, the, uh, uh, the reviews of the Iowa Baseball Confederacy were all serious. I don't think there were two out of the couple of hundred reviews I got that said this is a very funny novel. And I mean, all the strange things that go, that go on in that novel, the, uh, the what is it, the 12-hour church of time immemorial who operate 12 hours behind the rest of the world, uh, Leonardo da Vinci dropping in in a hot air balloon to explain how he uh, invented baseball, um, all these very, very strange things, and uh, virtually no one said this is a, this is a very humorous <laughs> novel. I, I was very surprised because they were all looking for the serious academic material, uh, which was there. I mean, there's, a, there's enough about sex and death in uh, all of my books to uh, uh, let uh, third-year English students write essays forever, but uh, the first, they're, sa they're meant to entertain you. I can get a few cheap thrills, right? Uh, right. That's right. Well, that, well, the story I actually liked out of the Iowa Baseball Confederacy confer concerned the outfielder who had a run from Iowa. Was it all the way to to New Mexico to, to track down a fly ball, and that goes along with why you really like baseball, because there are no constraints either on time or in space. You say the foul lines diverge forever. The problem with most professional parks is that it's still enclosed by a fence. I get the impression mm -hmm. you'd like to see baseball without fences. I think that would be ideal, because uh, as you said, the foul lines diverge forever, eventually taking in a good part of the universe. And uh, this makes for myth, and it makes for larger-than-life characters. And I think that's why there's been so much uh, good baseball fiction written and virtually nothing on the other sports, because they are twice enclosed, first by time and then by playing boundaries. Uh, there's no time limit on a baseball game. Uh, but uh, it doesn't matter how wonderful Shaquille O'Neal or Martina Navratilova are, they are trapped on these tiny playing surfaces, and it's very hard to... Uh, do anything magical with the situations that they're in. While it's relatively easy to do magical things uh, with baseball, because that uh, that fellow did run all the way to New Mexico, and uh, I think someone else got struck by lightning in the, in the outfield and sort of left his imprint on the outfield grass. And I mean, I think that's one of the funniest scenes that I uh, that I ever wrote. Mm -hmm. Well, in two ways, you, you get into the, those constraints or lack of constraints in the Iowa Baseball Confederacy, both that outfield are going a long ways for the fly ball. But in time, how long did that, that game go that you described, 2,614 innings, was it? You've probably got the number. I haven't uh, thought about that for quite a few years, but it's right in that area, yes. Okay, but that was your desire to, to show the lack of, of constraint of time as well then? Well, I'm not sure that I had any uh, academic reason for uh, doing that. It was just that uh, the... Uh, I, I was, of course, the game goes on for 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, if that isn't symbolic, I don't know uh, what is. Uh, and in a blinding rainstorm and, and so on. Uh, 
with Field of Dreams, it sounded like you did have some involvement, uh, especially as they had to work over the legalities on the J.D. Salinger character. But uh, were you a technical consultant in any way, or what, what, what were your other roles in the production of the movie? I didn't have any input into the movie at all. The uh, screenwriter kept in touch with me while he was doing the screenplay, and he said, look, there's no way that we can get a 300-page novel into an hour and 40-minute movie. We have to cut and cut and cut. We have to take out all the uh, all these lovely characters, the peripheral characters. We have to telescope time. We have to cut all these wonderful scenes. So I, I more or less understood what he was doing. I was thrilled with the screenplay, and uh, I loved the movie. Uh, most writers are not happy with what Hollywood does with their work and with good reason because they generally screw it up. But I was very lucky that uh, Phil Robinson wrote a wonderful screenplay. I had tears in my eyes when I read the screenplay and I said, oh, if this can just get transferred to the screen there will be no problems at all. And then Phil got to direct the movie so the script didn't get changed. I mean, my fear was that they would bring in a famous director who would say, well, uh, this isn't my vision. We uh, we need a car chase. You can't have a movie without a car chase. We need a few fist fights. We need some hot sex. Uh, and uh, that would have really changed the whole tone of Field of Dreams. So I, I, I was thrilled with it and really, uh, really loved the movie. How about the fact that they changed the name from Shoeless Joe? Did, would you have preferred that it, it stayed by the, with the same name? Well, I, I would have preferred it only for monetary reasons because uh, Dances with Wolves shot to the top of the bestseller list as soon as the movie came out. Uh, I did get to number eight or nine on the Times bestseller list uh, after Field of Dreams came out, but I would have sold uh, maybe 100,000 more books if the name of the movie had been the same of the as the book. Ironically, uh, we got down, when we were titling the book, I wrote it as the oldest living Chicago Cub, and the publisher said this is too peripheral a character to name the book after, so we got it down to Shoeless Joe and Dreamfield, and chose Shoeless Joe as the title. And without knowing that, the movie people t chose Field of Dreams, which was the best title for it. Right. And wow. I, wish I, had, I wish I had thought of that 15 years ago to title the novel Field of Dreams. Very close. Well, one thing, I don't know if it bothered you, I, I think it bothered a few of us as baseball fans to watch the movie and see Shoeless Joe Jackson hitting right-handed. Were you bothered by the fact that, that they had Ray Liotta or that they didn't make any attempt to get him hitting the way he truly did since this was the central character on the whole thing? Uh, that was the only way that Ray could hold the bat, uh, but uh, I didn't notice. I don't. Uh, I, I'm slightly dyslexic myself, uh, so uh, I never noticed uh, until it, someone pointed it out. Mm -hmm. So uh, it uh, doesn't bother me at all. Okay, so that <laughs> wasn't that wasn't really an issue with you. But y you at least think that that he and the others uh, portrayed their roles well, and you had so many uh, different players in there, whether they were actually named in the movie or not. Mm -hmm. No, I I thought uh, I mean it was important that Ray and uh, that Ray Liotta and uh, and Kevin do a good job, and I thought they were wonderful uh, as well as Burt Lancaster and Amy Madigan and James Earl Jones steals the show. Mm -hmm. A Field of Dreams, which derived from Shoeless Joe, remains a favorite movie of many people, and uh, we've been happy to have today as our guest W.P. Kinsella, and talking also some about his latest book, The Dixon Corn Belt League, and other baseball stories. Bill, thank you for uh, being our guest today, and, and thank you for joining us. presentation of the Hennepin County Library.